This week on Heroes Made in the USA, foreign correspondents under fire. Dan Rather calls him tough. The Soviets call him a criminal. The people of Afghanistan call cameraman Mike Hoover a hero. Oscar-winning director Oliver Stone barely scratched the surface of Richard Boyle's life in his film Salvador. There's enough material for more sequels than Rocky and Star Trek put together. Documentary filmmaker Jeff Harmon does know the meaning of the word fear. He just doesn't let it come between his camera and the story. Hello, I'm Joe Namer. Welcome to Heroes Made in the USA and Foreign Correspondents Under Fire. Now, whether or not a war involves American soil or soldiers, America is still involved. As citizens of the world, we are concerned for a fellow man and for ourselves that the disease of war may spread and destroy us all. Our first hero, cameraman Mike Hoover, risks his life so that we may all bear witness against war. Mike Hoover is rarely in this beautiful setting that he calls home. This is Jackson, Wyoming, where he lives in the shadow of the Grand Tetons. For the most part, this is where you find Mike Hoover, in the middle of Soviet-occupied Afghanistan, in the middle of war. Hoover has gone into Afghanistan 18 times in the last five years. His mission? To show the world just what's happening to the people of Afghanistan. Every trip is the last trip. Right from the very first one, that's it, I'm not doing it again, this is ridiculous, I got other things to do. I said, please tell me this is the last time you'll go there, and he, you know, he won't say that. I mean, he does, he says it all the time, but you know he doesn't mean it. One of the things that has made him successful is that Mike is physically a tough person. Now, this tough and this phony tough, and Mike's tough. You have to be tough to do what Hoover does. He, like the Mujahideen, travels hundreds of miles by foot with his camera and pack of supplies, ducking bombs and dodging landmines. If the people weren't so compelling, you wouldn't put up with what you have to put up with. Number two, number two. You know, I've been hit in the leg by uh, shrapnel. I have my shoulder torn up a bit by a bomb. Physically, it's not fun. But when you love the people, and by that I mean when you think of the people and you think of the friends you, moved, you met over there, you get a certain feeling, a little out of breathness, or I, I don't know what it is, that um, um, you're, doing it, you're doing it for them. And I'll be darned if you don't get a feeling that they'd do it for you too. The pictures and stories of war that Mike Hoover has captured show how a small country fights a David and Goliath battle against one of the largest military powers of the world, single-handedly. Here, Hoover's camera captures the ever-industrious Mujahideen, disarming a Soviet mine that did not explode. Their purpose? To use the explosive themselves against the Russians. <laughs> The child in the film that has his heel blown off that we're filming was very, very hard to film, and I couldn't wait till it was over to get out of there. And looking at it right now, I turned the other way. Here, Hoover, using a special night vision lens, follows a Mujahideen with his last remaining rocket to fire against a Russian armament. One very graphic scene shows how the Mujahideen came upon what looked like a harmless child's doll that turned out to be a bomb. It was too weird looking to see all these old tin cans from the Russians and cigarette butts and stuff with this doll perched there. You know, it just it should have been kicked over or something. It was just too perfect. And so we said, you never know, let's set it up. And Gron reached around with a stick and the thing blew up and dirt came out of the windows and the door got blown off. And the more times I go in there, the more frightened I become. And the more difficult it is for me to make myself hold that camera up when the action is happening, instead of pulling down and doing, doing the, uh, the natural thing to protect yourself. There's something about being shot at and not hit that gives you the giggles. But that is sheer foolishness. So my attitude is, I have to go over there and show what's going on. There's a certain amount of risk in that, and I do everything I can to limit that risk. 
there can be no overstating the risk to someone such as Mike when he goes in there today, and as he tries to go in there, there's a price on his head, as there's a price on almost anyone's head, uh, including my own, for that matter, who's, who's been to Afghanistan, but especially with Mike, because he's been in so often. He's been so effective uh, that those who don't like what Mike Hoover is doing would prefer to keep him out or to catch him inside more than any other journalist in the world. There have been um, two assassination attempts on me, and there have been, um, and there is supposedly an outstanding uh, reward for me if I am captured alive. That not everybody in the country yet understands what's going on in Afghanistan. It's because of Mike's heroism, a lot more people understand it today than understood it a few years ago. Probably the thing that I've learned most by going into Afghanistan 18 times is about my own country. When you're surrounded by your environment, it's hard to tell what your environment is really like. But when you go out to a situation as foreign as Afghanistan, an invaded poor little country that's being oppressed with millions of refugees, you get a chance to reflect back on what you have come from. You realize that we don't live in the real world. We live in heaven compared to the rest of the world. Coming up next on Heroes Made in the USA, the anti-hero of Oliver Stone's Salvador, the real Richard Boyle, and documentary filmmaker Jeff Harmon, who plays Russian roulette in Afghanistan. Over the last 20-odd years, combat photographer Richard Boyle has covered every major war in the world. Vietnam, Cambodia, Israel, Northern Ireland, Lebanon, Nicaragua, and El Salvador. Making for himself a personal reputation as sensational as his pictures, eventually Hollywood decided to cover him. The result? The acclaimed motion picture Salvador, which Boyle co-wrote with Oscar-winning director Oliver Stone. I kind of weaseled around a lot in my life, you know what I mean? I was trying to get the edge all the time, but I basically I would say that I'm a good-hearted person. I haven't really done anything malicious in my life. Um, I haven't done anything really very great in my life either, you know. I've tried to do some things, tried to find some truth. I wrote the I character like of uh, Richard Boyle in Salvador uh, uh, as a, uh, something of a slimy, drunking, pot-smoking, uh, whoring uh, individual, which I have been in my life. And if I was too hard on myself, I'd rather have it that way than make myself look too noble. We tried for, in the film Salvador, for, for realism. We tried to make it look like it really was. Though not the typical hero, it is that mixture of human frailty combined with a passion for the truth that has placed Richard Boyle always in the center of the action. But Boyle remembers his first assignment as much more frailty than passion. It was Vietnam, 1965. The first time somebody's shooting at you and you realize they're trying to kill me, is that I, the first time I come back, I, I messed up my camera, my film got all exposed, I didn't get any good shots, uh, and I was petrified. After the first few times, you begin to feel, hey, this ain't so bad. You know, you survived the first two brushes with it, and uh, hey, this is easy. There's one thing I think that uh, war photographers tend to, to forget, and that is that when you're looking through the lens of a camera, you have kind of invincibility. You have like, that's happening out there. It's like a movie that's not happening to you. And I think if, if that's often pencil reporters get more terrified because they don't, aren't doing anything. They're sitting there taking notes and getting scared. Well, when you're shooting, you, you, you keep shooting and, and you know, doing, going about your business. Now, this picture here, for example, this was the National Police in, in Saigon firing at the press and the, the congressman. After I took the picture, the guy turned around and fired at me. And, uh, that's scary. Well, let me tell you my first experience, my first time in combat. I was, I was out with the, the Vietnamese Rangers uh, in, in uh, uh, South Vietnam, in the Mekong Delta. And they uh, found this kid. He was maybe 15, 16. And they questioned him. And the way they questioned him, they stuck a bayonet in his gut. And every time he didn't answer the question, they kept cutting higher. So eventually, they disemboweled him. And the whole time, he didn't say anything. I mean, he never talked, never said a word. The American advisors told me not to, not to photograph the incident, not to report it, and if I proceeded, they would have seized my camera and my film. So what I did is I snuck the shot I mean, by looking away and, and getting the shot whilst 
talking to somebody else, clicking it off. All armies want basically to project a good side. Uh, the problem is when you see things that they know you see, which projects them in a, in a bad way. Well, Milai Massacre is when the uh, American troops uh, massacred uh, several hundred um, uh, Vietnamese civilians. And the government, would get, get us another example of a cover-up. The government was trying to cover up the fact that this happened. They said Herb Lee's photos were faked, that these were people killed by the Viet Cong or killed in, by mistaken bombings. They were not massacred, so on. Well, I went in with my interpreter, who was a Vietnamese uh, uh, French woman, and we, you know, even though they tried to block us, we found the survivors, the actual people that did survive. And there was a woman, uh, this woman here, was uh, shot in the hip, badly wounded, and thrown into a ditch. And on top of the ditch, uh, her children, her other members of the village, her relatives, piled on top of her as the Americans kept firing into the ditch. She survived by laying motionless for four hours. And she told us this story. And when she was telling it, uh, one of the Wat Vu, uh, the South Vietnamese government secret police, came up and shoved a, uh, a gun in, in my gut and said, stop, doing, stop taking pictures and stop doing the interview. I told him to go stuff it and told my, my interpreter to keep, keep getting the story. And we did. She told about it. Then the whole thing caved in, the government denial, and it came out that it did happen. It requires uncommon courage to take pictures in defiance of armed soldiers and guerrillas. But an even tougher role for Boyle has been that of witness to the inhumanity of war. Uh, there's no such thing as a good or clean war. And uh, I've seen atrocities by all sides. And I, all sides. And I think that you cannot to keep your objectivity. You cannot get too tied into with one side or the other. You know, I think that you have to keep your objectivity. This is a photograph of the four leaders of the uh, uh, FDR, the Frente, in El Salvador, who were engaged in uh, lawful and peaceful political activities. In fact, they were holding a press conference. Uh, Davison's uh, goon squads, the death squads, dragged them out, uh, tortured them, uh, castrated them, uh, brutally uh, chopped them up. Uh, uh, and uh, this is a photo of their bodies in the morgue. Uh, this kind of stuff goes on all the time down there. When I saw this kind of stuff, I physically sick. I mean, it was a, but not, I still want to get the shot of it. Because I think it's important, throughout history, photographs of war have had a huge impact. I do sense you know, a sense of, of being a part of history, seeing it, being there right when it's happening. And yeah, and I, and I, it's, it's a great exhilaration after you've been in combat. Coming back, you may be scared at the moment, coming back and, and having that, that smoke or that drink and think, wow, I've made it, and just, wow, you know? And uh, it's, it's kind of hard to describe. There's nothing, nothing really similar to it. Uh, I've tried other things, you know, uh, you know, I've got a Porsche, I like to drive fast, you know, the Department of Motor Vehicles doesn't, <laughs> doesn't really appreciate it. Uh, uh, but there are no other substitutes uh, for, 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 for that rush of, of being in, in, in combat. At least I haven't found it. Combat photography will, will, will never disappear. Uh, as long as there's a war, there's going to be somebody crazy enough to go out there and try and take a picture of it. Coming up next on Heroes Made in the USA, Jeff Harmon filming life and death in El Salvador and Afghanistan. Our last hero, Jeff Harmon of New York City, is more of a, a documentary filmmaker than a journalist. Like any filmmaker, he craves human drama and realism. And there's no more realistic human drama than war. Jeff Harmon does not consider himself a journalist, but a filmmaker. In making his two documentaries, Jihad in Afghanistan and The Front Line in El Salvador, Harmon risked his life not just to bring back the news, but to bring back stories about people. And I'm not interested in the politicians. I'm not interested in the, the generals or the colonels. I'm interested in the privates. I'm interested in the peasants on the front lines, the ones who are the cannon fodder. And th th these are the people that I, I live with and spend time with. And I want to get into their skulls and into their souls. And I want to show the war through their eyes. For his film, Jihad, Harmon literally became one of the Mujahideen, an Afghan rebel. The only reason we could get so close to them was because my cameraman and I became a part of their unit. We became a part of them. We became 
one of them. I mean, at times the camera just became invisible. But that's the, the, the legwork and the research and the spending time with them and living with them. And I turn on the camera when everyone else turns off the camera. Only when I've spent the time to peel off all the masks that people wear, that my characters wear, that's when I start filming, when I'm as close to their essence, to their core, as possible. But Harmon has witnessed these same people commit atrocities and torture. I mean, there was one time, for instance, where they were humiliating this one communist prisoner. And um, the commander handed me a sword and asked me if I wanted to chop off his head. And, well, I didn't know whether he was joking or not, but I declined. You know, that was, you know, that's just part of the game. You're dealing with a war situation. Both sides torture each other, kill each other. That's part of war. You know, you don't get squeamish and say, oh my goodness, how can they cut off somebody's leg or do this? I mean, that's part of war. But Harmon doesn't just act as a witness to such atrocity. When the presence of a journalist is punishable by torture and execution without trial, Jeff Harmon is living at even greater risk than his subjects. He pulled out his knife and um, I stood up and he just marked my stomach where he was going to disembowel me. And I felt like I, I, I knew that my life was ending. I knew that my life was ending. And I felt like a barnyard animal, like a chicken in a barnyard that, you know, is going to be grabbed and it's kind of pecking on the ground. But I just concentrated on those two other s soldiers that were with him. And when he thrust the knife towards my stomach, they, they grabbed his wrist. And they said in, in Kiswahili, don't do it, please don't do it. Of course, the greatest risk comes to Jeff when he is actually in battle. Unlike the soldiers around him, the filmmaker has more to worry about than just surviving. You're under fire, and you've got to keep in mind that when you're a soldier and you're under fire, all you think about is keeping belly down and surviving, and maybe firing back at the enemy. But when you're filming, You've got to be just a, raised a little bit higher than all those other combatants because you've got to work and you've got to film them. And combat is like lightning. It always strikes the highest point. And you always got to be just a little higher than everybody else. In fact, Jeff's work is not only dangerous to himself, but his very presence can lead to catastrophe for the army units he travels with. The very act of having a camera in a volatile situation is going to increase the risk. I mean, the best example was, was in Afghanistan and Kandahar when the Soviets and Afghan army found out that journalists were there, that filmmakers were there, they launched an operation to stop the making of the film. Well, now 25 Mujahideen were killed and 37 were wounded. Well, if I'm going to be totally honest, I have to say that that operation was due to the fact that me and my cameraman were there. And those are the risks one takes, and those are the responsibilities one takes. If you don't have the stomach to be in that situation and to perhaps by your very presence to be the catalyst for violence or for, for deaths, then you shouldn't be there in the first place. But while Harmon may appear to be a man possessed, he is clearly not just a thrill seeker. Any war correspondent who tells you, who gives you some story about they're doing it because they hate war and war is hell and they're, you know, they're doing it for, out of social justice or whatever, doesn't know what they're talking about. They're lying to you and they're lying to themselves. I would never have gone into this line of work if I wasn't drawn to it. I'm drawn by the abyss to enter it, to come out of it and articulate it. I'm not afraid to die. I'm afraid of not living my life fully. That, that's the only thing I could possibly fear. Not accomplishing all the things that I want to do, making the films that I want, reaching the people that I want. That, that would bother me. The three men you have just met are the lucky ones. They are still alive, while hundreds of American journalists have died on battlefronts all over the world. Don't take the news for granted. Television and newspapers offer us the tragedy of war in words and pictures. With the power of this knowledge, we can begin to create a world without war. I'm Joe Namath. Thanks for joining us.